good evening to one and all present here. Here's a very hearty welcome, big and warm enough to encompass you all. It is my pleasure to have you here this evening for the ninth bigger and bolder session of the Leadership and Entrepreneurship Aspiration Development Series. Why I said that this is bigger and bolder is not merely because of the number nine, but also because of our guest today. As you all know, Asian Education Group invites top industry professionals wherein they share their high-valued experiences, guide students towards innovative thinking, benefits of new ventures, self-development, and attributes for being an effective and efficient leader. Few of the speakers under the LEAD program include Sri Pranab Mukherjee, Dr. Kiran Bedi, Mr. Sagar Daryani, founder Wow Momos, General Bikram Singh, former Chief of Army Staff of India, Mr. R.K. Somani, Managing Director, HSIL Limited, in where Mr. Richard Recky, former CEO, KPMG, to name a few. I guarantee you learning, I guarantee you a vision, and I surely guarantee you to meet somebody who is very, very charismatic, and well, I realized this within my first two minutes of introduction with him. Today we have one of the most renowned and experienced professional, a big asset to the industry with us today. Sri R. Gopalakrishnan, former director, Tata Sons Limited. An author, startup mentor, a visionary with remarkable professional experience of over five decades, headed the top management positions in most reputed organizations, both national and international. He has served as chairman of Unilever Arabia, as MD of Group One Lipton, and vice chairman of Hindustan Unilever, a director of Tata Sons and several Tata companies. He serves as an independent director and non-executive chairman of Castrol India and also an independent director of Hamis Holdings PLC Sri Lanka. You all will be amazed to know that Sir started his career back in 1967 and since then he has been climbing up the ladders with most reputed public and private sector enterprises both nationally and over international stretch. You name a big public sector organization and Sir would say I have headed the directorship. To name a few, Sir has headed Tata Sons Limited, Tata Chemicals Limited, Rallis India Limited, Tata Technologies Limited, Castrol India, ABP Private Limited, etc. It is my utmost pleasure to extend a cheerful welcome to you, Sir, and I would request you to share your highly valued experience with all of us and especially our students who are very, very eager and excited to hear from you. We welcome you, Sir. Well, thank you very much, uh, Garima and Ravi Sharmaji, for inviting me to talk to AG. It's uh, finally the rain has broken in Bombay, so I'm able to look out of my window and see a little chalak of sunlight. So it's a nice atmosphere to talk to you. And uh, nowadays webinars have become very common. And uh, I was given a profile of what kind of people are attending this webinar. Uh, and I think many of them are students or management professionals or uh, management academics. So I've chosen today to talk about a subject which I consider very, very important and interesting for the future of India. Uh, there is little doubt in anybody's mind that when all this coronavirus and so on is behind us and whatever the new scenario, the new normal is will emerge, we need a strong business and enterprise community. Small scale, medium scale, big scale, we need companies. And we need companies which can last long, which can become institutions. We don't want fireflies, we just come for a few years, make some money, maybe with a scam and then they go away. So we are looking to build companies into institutions. So I've used this time during the last two years, three years, to reflect on all my experiences over the last 50 years uh, and to join hands with some academics at the SP Jain Institute of Management and Research, where I go four times in a month. Uh, to do some piece of work, which I'm very excited about. And I want to share that with you. And I therefore, given the title to this uh, talk as Shaping Business Institutions. Uh, 
So that's the subject I want to cover. I think I will speak for maybe 30 minutes. Uh, Garima ji, and then you'll take questions or you'll direct questions at me on behalf yes. of the students. Yeah, so you, short can, level. you can curate the questions. So I must give you a helicopter ride because, you know, five professors, two of economics, two of organizational behavior, and one of entrepreneurship, and I. So we are six of us who have worked on this, and I'm speaking on their behalf. I'd just like to mention their names. Professor Tulsi Jay Kumar of uh, SPJN, they're all of SPJN. Professor M. Suresh Rao of SPJN, uh, Professor Pallavi Modi, Professor Sushmita Srivastav, and Professor Lata Dev. So, very high powered. They're all doctorates. I'm the only <laughs> simple fellow <laughs> without a doctorate. Now, this is one of the rare occasions, in my knowledge, where a seasoned practitioner has collaborated with five academics. Otherwise, during my long career, I've noticed academics have a different swimming pool and practitioners have a different swimming pool. And entry of one into the other is not common. But not only have we had a common swimming pool, but uh, we have produced something out of it. Uh, a practical sort of useful thing and yet which is academically sound. So I would hope that there will be many more such opportunities when practitioners can collaborate with academics rather than academics writing papers which go in academic journals and practitioners not writing at all or writing hagiographies about themselves and their companies. So I'm trying to get these to me. And we have published six books as a result of this work. It's been going on for about two and a half years. Um, uh, and we have identified and written about six in, uh, businesses which are either already institutions or show the great promise of becoming institutions. Uh, the first one is uh, how TCS, Tata Consultancy Services, uh, created a brand new industry for India, in which we interviewed the venerable Mr. Fakir Chatkoli, who's now 96, and uh, the founder, and uh, Mr. S. Ramadure, who succeeded him. So between the two, we got a history of almost 40 years. Um, the second company we went to was Biocon, which has a woman entrepreneur in the field of the future. How uh, Kiran Mazumdar Shaw fermented Biocon. That's the second book. And how she built up this company called Biocon. By the way, all these are multi-billion dollar groups now. Okay, So I, I will not go through the numbers in the interest of time. The third book was uh, Larson and Tubro, where we wrote a book called How Anil Nayak Changed the Trajectory of Larson and Tubro. Now, although the company itself is about 60, 70 years old, it really came into prominence in the public domain in the last 30 years. And Anil Nayak was like de facto the founder. And those three books are written and they're already in the market and they're available on your Kindle or they're available on uh, uh, my book partner, uh, I think uh, Ravi, Ravi Sharma knows uh, about that and you can get free delivery of those books. Right after the lockdown is over, the other three books will come out. They're already written. One is how Deepak Parikh built up HDFC Group into probably India's largest valued group of companies. The fifth one is how Harsh Maniwala groomed Mariko into a multi-billion dollar consumer goods company. And the sixth one is uh, how Uday Kotak made Kotak Mahindra Bank into such a valuable company. Now, these books are not uh, about the person. They are about the institutions. Usually, so they don't carry a picture of the guy on the front cover. Neither is it written by a person who has been paid to write the story. I'm not saying those are bad things, but I'm merely saying that these academics have... Uh, you know, serious-minded academics uh, want to understand what's inside the company. And having me to guide them, because I have been a CEO myself for the last 30 years, probably helped to make a... Now, have we written books which uh, give you a Brahma Mantra? Not really. Because you can't learn management by chanting a Brahma Mantra. Even Baba Ramdev has not reached the stage of <laughs> making that happen. 
as you know management is like a performing art it's like dance it's like music uh, each time lata ji sings her songs mahol ke upar the song comes out differently sometimes pandit nehru dies cries sometimes people's hearts leap out when they watch it on the movie screen and sometimes she sings for herself um, and the same is true of any performing art and the same is true of management whatever they teach you at asian educational group don't think that that's a brahma mantra your own teachers will confirm that to you but uh, they demonstrate how in one particular mahol a particular thing worked that's why all the six books are very important because uh, it's like saying uh, uh, are there different types of music i would like to listen to would you go to a spotify site which had only the same music by the same person all the time i suppose not because it's not enjoyable so all these six books are demonstrating now the question is and in your mind rightly you say theek hai bhai ram kahani to suna diya what what is the stuff all about so let me just come to that subject the basic hypothesis that we came to two and a half years ago was is there a difference between a good ceo who runs a good company and a shaper who shapes an institution will it just become a play of words or is there really some difference and i raised this question at some faculty meeting you know i have spent all my career attending board meetings not faculty meetings <laughs> the faculty meetings are quite different you know and so it was a good experience for me and for the faculty to have a kida like me uh, was also probably a different experience and i raised this question and over the next four or five weeks uh these faculty whose names i mentioned a while ago produced a big pota you know of research papers Uh, written on this sort of subject each one did his or her own search and i was suddenly given a lot of erudite papers written in foreign journals and they called it a class journal and b class journal and so on and so forth. and i said my god what am i going to do with all this uh i did take the trouble i said if they've taken the trouble to produce all this literature search then i must go through it so i went through it and i said in a company in a business it will never work to give a 500 page report so i have to convert this into one single sheet of paper that's what we are trained to do as practitioners you know and i didn't do this all by myself i must tell you i must sat down with these five people and it took a number of iterations and then we arrived at what i call the brahma mantra what looks like a brahma mantra it's like gayatri you know gayatri did not gayatri mantra did not just come overnight after a lot of munins uh, muni jis and so on sat and contemplated they produced om bhur bhur swa and is meaning and you know very well that just because you learnt it by heart doesn't mean you are a very holy or good person but you have to do very many things that go with the gayatri mantra so we produced a sort of gayatri mantra for for shaping an institution and it is that gayatri mantra that i want to share with you today with the promise that it is not a magical gayatri mantra but uh, something to arouse your curiosity and hopefully some of you who are interested will get hold of those books in your college library or you can buy the books they are very inexpensive not very expensive and look at how other people have shaped institutions because india desperately needs institutions in the future and people like you who are studying management and teachers like those who are listening to today's lecture are shaping the shapers so you know this is quite a fantastic combination the teachers are there the students are there and i'm told there are a few practitioners also who can apply this in their companies tomorrow right so firstly what is the difference between a good company and a good institution so i want you to sit back and just relax and i'll tell you some names a fantastic looking bungalow in golf links delhi fully marble air conditioned seven bedrooms you know with a big lawn in front think of that and then i say lal kila i say which is an institution i think the answer is self evident you're unlikely to say the golf links bungalow is an institution i tell you 
Agra ka Taj Mahal. And on the other side, I tell you Kabristan in Park Circus in Calcutta. <laughs> I mean, Taj Mahal is just a big fat Kabristan, right? If you, if you, if you cut out all the... And therefore, uh, the concept of an institution in our imagination is something that is grand, awesome, long-lasting, inspiring. And howsoever beautiful a house I construct today, or even if I create another Kabiristan for, if somebody else creates a Kabiristan for his wife today, like to match the Taj Mahal will not be easy. So, institution has this connotation of awesome, grand, and long-lasting. So, having defined it, I said, what is the difference between a good CEO and a shaper? Is a, are they doing about the same things in different ways? So, I want to tell you very briefly how they differ. Because then you have the Brahma Mantra. What does a good CEO of an ordinary company do, good company, and what does the shaper of an institution do? They're, they're very different. If you take a good company CEO in terms of his attention span, what he devotes his time to, he is focused on solving problems efficiently. And a shaper is concerned with long-term sustainability. They're two different things. A uh, typical good company, good CEO will say, Rose ka kaam karte karte dam bud jata hai. Long term sochne ka samay nahi hai. I'm sure many of your professors in the institute also say that. But a long term educationist is able to think, what should be the new education policy? How should different forms of teaching come? They think of long term sustainability. So the first difference between a shaper and a CEO is in terms of their attention span. The second is, their purpose. Why are they doing whatever they are doing? Uh, a good CEO says, I must deliver shareholder returns. So he's highly focused on profitability, return on capital employed, uh, you know, share price. Whereas uh, a shaper is thinking of stakeholder responsibility. Employees, uh, vendors, community, so you can see even today in the COVID situation, uh, there are some companies, especially the startups, they just lay off thousand people, uh, you know. And there are some other companies which have been around for a long time, and they say we will pay you, but uh, we will pay you seventy percent of the wage. There will be thirty percent cut. So that's the difference I'm making between being very shareholder focused and being uh, long term focused. Then the third I would point out in the way they think, because at the end of the day, all managers and executives are hired because they're capable of thinking. It's the mind. And uh, if you look at uh, uh, a good company leader, he or she operates on the basis, I think I've learned more or less what there is to learn. I've been done my MBA in Asian education group 20 years ago. And now I have attended some advanced management program at uh, XYZ school. Uh, and I know things. And those who don't know, the younger people will come to me, I'll give them answers. That's the mindset of it. Whereas uh, uh, a shaper says, Are, I know a lot of things, but it's still so small. There is so much more to learn. So his shaper is a cyclical learner. He's always got an air of humility about his learning. Because he has to keep learning every day. Uh, the last point I would point out is the mindset of what kind of a game they are playing. See, there are two kinds of games. Uh, Simon Sinek has written a book on this. I'm sure it's available in your laboratory, in your uh, library, and you can access it about the infinite game, the infinite mindset. Some people play the game of business as a finite game. Now, what is the difference between a finite game and an infinite game? In a finite game, the rules are clear. The ways to win are clear. Somebody is judging you. So if you see a tennis game, tennis match or a football match, it is clear. The rules are clear. There's an umpire. At the end of a certain period of time, you know the outcome. A won and B lost. Okay? Uh, that's a finite game. 
But an infinite game is one that goes on, it never ends. You know? So, uh, an example of an uh, infinite game is marriage. <laughs> marriage is a very good. It is not something, a good marriage never ends until God has called it to order. And you have discussions. You are not trying to win. If a husband is trying to win over the wife or the wife is trying to win over the husband, and then you got a problem. You win some, you lose some. A mother and child relationship is an infinite game. There will be differences, there will be raising of temperatures, there will be, but you know, a child is a child and the mother is a mother. So, human relationships tend to become infinite games and your company relationships tend to become a finite game. Now, if you run your company as a finite game, I have become the dean of this management college. I have got five years. That's a finite game. I have become chairman of a public sector undertaking or a private company as the case may be. I know I have to retire at 60, so without any CBI inquiry, let me just finish this and go. That's a finite game. An infinite game, they say that I will do this for three years, but after this I'm going to do something else. And after that I'm going to do something else. My first chairman, Prakash Tandon, he became chairman of Hindustan, the first Indian chairman of Praka, uh, Hindustan Diva in 1961. And when I joined the company, he was a chairman. He was close to retirement. But it is not that he packed up his bags, took his pension and went and lived quietly. I'm not saying it's good or bad. But right after that, he became the chairman of State Trading Corporation. Then he became the chairman of the Punjab National Bank. Then he wrote his books. Uh, then he became... Uh, member of the India International Center in Delhi. And right till the time he died at 90, he was busy doing things. He was playing an infinite game. So, shapers are people who play infinite games in an infinite way. Whereas, uh, a reasonable CEO of a reasonable company is playing a finite game. So, I've given you a chalak, you know, four or five points of difference between uh, how a, a shaper thinks of things and how a CEO operate. But why do we have enterprise at all? I mean, I have seen many people who think that all businessmen are crooks. Uh, if they are in the private sector, they are out to make money. And management colleges will run courses on ethics in business and ethics in management, giving the impression there are a whole lot of crooks out there. <laughs> so this is the moral code you should follow. I know many people who think all bureaucrats and politicians are crooks that they are always taking bribes. But uh, that's a very partial and limited view. Um, you know, if you want a happy society, and who doesn't want a happy society? All of us are working to have a happy society. Then you must have enterprise. Enterprise is what keeps the wheels of a society moving. You get some income. Honest enterprise, I agree. And there are crooks. There are as many crooks in business as there are in the bureaucracy, in the judiciary, and in the politics. I don't think any of them has more share, market share of crooks. Uh, but if you do enterprise, then you're able to generate some money and profits. And when you generate money and profits, you're able to support education, health, culture, arts. These are all very important things for a society. And if you have education, health, culture, because enterprise is feeding it, then you have a sense of ecstasy. I therefore call it the 3E formula. Enterprise, education, and ecstasy. Because then you have a nice, wholesome life. And that's the way young people should also plan their careers. It is not just about making money and becoming vice president and president and earning lots of money and having a bungalow and a nice... Uh, two cars in the garage. But you must be cultured, you must read and you must have ecstasy. Uh, and enterprise is therefore a very... In the old days, uh, you would read that uh, Indian trading prospered because the Maharaja supported it. Even dance forms like Kathak and Bharatanatyam were supported by the uh, Zamindar or the Maharaja of that particular area because they had the money to support it. And that's how uh, the house of Awadh became so famous uh, and Lucknow has become famous and Tanjavur in my parts of the country. So, 
it is very important to know that business people play a very important role in society very important role in society so once you've got all these in your mind then you imagine what's an institution i must tell you a little bit about how this research project came along i mentioned to you that i was sitting down with these academics and discussing it and they wrote this big pota and i said well we must uh, create something which is different there are lots of books available in the market like uh, 40 years ago i think uh, they wrote uh, lessons from the most excellent companies uh, i think it is tom peters and uh, water waterman peters and waterman and they were all american or european companies and they wrote about how they practiced excellence it's a separate uh, on the lighter side a separate fact that uh, of all the companies they wrote within 3 or 4 years many of them ran into deep trouble and there's almost axiomatic that as soon as you are written about you get into trouble <laughs> i hope that doesn't happen with the books that we have written but we are not written about the individual of course we are written about the company uh, then you have books uh, which your faculty will undoubtedly will be able to guide you to like good to great by jim collins uh, how to build excellent companies and so on. you got half a dozen books james chappy uh, jim collins these are all well known names in this field but they are all about building excellent institutions uh, in american context nobody neither practitioners nor uh, academics have written a usable book something that can make an operating manager think about it and apply it in an indian context and the indian context is important many of our companies are family managed businesses and we have some cultural traditions whether they are good or bad i don't want to argue but they are there uh, respect to elders uh, not arguing forcefully uh, trying to keep the family together occasionally it breaks down but in many cases people keep the family together um, people have to wait for the buzurgs of the family to move on so there are many cultural factors in india indian managers are extremely adaptable because that's the way we are brought up from the time you are a child you got this fall solve problems getting into school is a problem getting your birth certificate is a problem getting into kindergarten is a problem getting into primary school is a problem getting into college is a problem each one the competition is so high i mean it's easier to get into carnegie mellon university or uh, berkeley university than to get into iit it's easier to get a job in america than to get into state bank probationer you look at the number of people who apply for those jobs so we are we are brought up in a very competitive situation and another dean of uh, the institute sp jain and i have written a book called the made in india manager why do indian managers succeed so well when they go abroad that's a separate book and i'm not going to talk about it today but uh, my friend uh, rohit enterprises whom uh, ravi sharma is in touch with uh, has given a list of those books to him and if any of you is interested you can always get a copy and read it so indian managers are brought up with great adaptability with great uh, competitiveness and uh, this is what makes them who they are and therefore uh, when they come to shape an institution there are eight rules that they have to follow and we have written that in each of the books you'll find in each book uh, a double spread page which says the mba grid mba doesn't stand for management of business administration it stands for mindset behavior and action and we really hypothesized and this is what all the research stuff was converted into one page if you can think of three columns mindset what is your mindset because that determines your approach your approach determines how you behave and your behavior determines how you act so if i come to the mindset if i come with the mindset that all mba students are useless i am just taking as an example then i will behave with you in a condescending manner and my actions will not be very endearing to you conversely if i say all mbas are gods you know sometimes we approach our politicians with the mindset that he is a very powerful man i better get on his good side 
our behavior automatically makes us bend at our hip you know sab jhuk jate hain aise <laughs> as soon as they see a politician and their action is haan ji haan ji huzur so you see mindset behavior and action is a very important sequence in the way we think and so far as uh, shaping a company is concerned into an institution there are eight of them i'll just read them out time doesn't allow me to explain but if uh, garima has questions from you or from herself i'm very happy to answer it but that will become more interactive otherwise it's a bit boring to sit and listen for such a long time <coughs> the first one we've identified and we've described in the book how these actually work are they just nice uh, management stuff or is it real uh, the first one is people relations people relations means employees it means distributors it means vendors it means shareholders it means community and i am very lucky i have worked in unilever i worked in tata both fantastic companies for this i mean when jamshed ji tata was setting up uh, jamshedpur the the steel plant had not even come up right there is just a jungle there sachi and he wrote to his son and he said when the steel plant comes up make sure you create a city where people will want to live with parks with wide roads with water and uh, today jamshedpur and the township of uh, tatas there is probably the best city to live in in terms of clean air and uh, schooling and anybody any mother or father any parent who has a child at least up to the age of 18 school excellent school is available life is comfortable after that they may need to move out because of college and so on and so forth. so people relation the sense of empathy for people and uh, feelings for people is the first and the most important the second one is the ability to think short term and long term simultaneously you know people who say that oh my whole day goes in telephone calls and meetings and whatsapp i don't have time to think about the long term have to rethink whether that's the way they want to lead their life uh, the best example non corporate example i can take of short term and long term simultaneously is just look at your mother now all of us have a mother or a sister or a wife depending on your status who's raising a baby see a mother is fantastic she is able to think for the short term so the baby is crying it needs a feed it has just crapped and the nappy has to be changed but she doesn't stop thinking about the long term she's also dreaming that this child will grow up to study to become a lawyer to become uh a professor at uh, asian education group whatever whatever you know she's she must go to dance class she must go to uh, uh tennis class or whatever so the way a parent is raising a child shows the ability of a human being to think of short and long term simultaneously it's a bit messy to do both simultaneously but all of us do it instinctively nobody teaches us who teaches a 26 year old girl to become a mother and she learns and then she becomes a mother in law and somebody else becomes a mother and so the so the journey carries on and the best teacher for a shaper to develop short and long term thinking is is the mother the woman and if you observe them you'll learn how to manage both but put the business context on it and our books cover many stories of how people have learned to do both the third one i would draw your attention to is what we call critical thinking critical thinking means not choosing action from the most obvious points that come for the issue i have to solve this problem is pe kya kiya jaye root a root b root c then you say theek hai kaun sa kiya jaye acha root c kare rest to root c but uh, shaper will say is there no other alternative so again metaphors help to explain the point imagine that a geologist lands on the moon for the first time what would the geologist do he say yaar main to chandrama ke dharti pe aa gaya hu he will start digging the ground he will take out soil samples niche jayega pani hai kya koi jaan jantar hai kya and he will come back with a lot of moon craters and geological information imagine that in the same spacecraft you send an astronomer 
he will not be interested in what's under the ground. He'll say, yaar, ye kya mahol hai? Yahan se aur kya dikta hai? What is this moon a part of? So you see, they look at very different things. When, when uh, Both have landed on the moon and the geologists will go into the subject and the astronomer will draw back from the subject. That's what I mean by uh, critical thinking. The ability to think out of the box, which we call loosely. There are five more and I will hold those. I will just mention the names, orbit shifting, breaking barriers. I know there are problems. Nobody gets a way to shape an institution with a smooth road. You know, there will be potholes and difficulties. Um, the levers of change. You have to be very careful to understand what are your possibilities. A lever of change, I'll give you an example. When I was a youngster, I'm coming from a Tamil-speaking household. I already had to learn Bengali because I was born and raised in Calcutta. Uh, of course, I spoke Tamil at home. I spoke Bengali with my friends. Uh, I spoke English because I went to an English school. Uh, I had to learn Hindi because it was Rashtrabhasha. It was fairly complicated to learn all these languages. But many Indians do this. It's not something special that I have done. Most Indians will speak at least two, if not three languages. You know. Uh, at that time, there was a member of parliament. His name was Purushottam Das Tandan. He's one of those UP cutter fellows, you know. And he said, Hindi Rashtrabhasha hai sabko Hindi mein sab polna padega. And I remember the South said, go to hell. We don't know what the hell Hindi is. And the South was ablaze. Uh, nobody wanted to speak Hindi. And Pandit Nehru had a dilemma. Ki, kya kiya jai? <clears throat> anyway, he said for 15 years, all languages will continue. And of course, that 15 years became 30 years, 45 years. And now it's still carrying on as a new education policy also. Because India is a very interesting and different sort of country, diverse country. But look what happened to Hindi. Unknown to anybody. Unknown and unplanned. Uh, certain people called Ashok Kumar, Dilip Kumar, Devanand, Raj Kapoor. Lata Mangeshkar, they created Bollywood. They created Hindi movie world. So Hindi was spoken there. Urdu was spoken there. There was a pretty girl. There was a handsome boy chasing her around trees, singing songs to each other, making every young fellow feel that he should be chasing that little girl or that little girl feel that boy should be chasing me. And it didn't matter in which language they were talking. People said, Utta to Hindi samadhara chahiye ki Hindi ka movie samadhi. And Hindi has now become popular. Not spoken at home, obviously. If you go deep into Tamil Nadu, one day I was in a small place which you can't even pronounce. Tiritra Pundi. If I told you two, two times also, you will not be able to pronounce it. And they were watching, you know what? On TV. This is back in the 90s. Uh, or thereabout. Kaun banega Karodpati? And Amita Bachchan saying, Lock kya jai? And I told these guys in Tamil, I said, hey, do you understand what's going on? Do you know who this guy is? And they all rolled their head as a good Tamil would. They said, sir, how does it matter, sir, when one crore is involved? <laughs> Let it be Hindi or Tamil, it doesn't matter. So this is what I mean by saying breaking barriers and levers of change. Family planning. I remember when uh, uh, the 50s and 60s, uh, the government, the DAVP as it's called, started a family planning campaign to say, uh, they showed a black and white movie of a young couple getting married with Sahara and flowers and everything. And then the voiceover would come. Shadi ki mubarak ho. Lekin, paan saal ke liye bache nahi hone chahiye. And it is a disaster. It is a flop. Complete flop. Because in the Indian social context, if the daughter-in-law is not delivering within two years, then there's lots of social pressure, you know, the mother-in-law, sister-in-law, goes, goes, goes. So after five years, they changed the campaign. This is what I mean by levers of change, breaking barrier. They showed the same couple with one baby in the hand and said, now for the next five years, don't have the second child. And that worked. It worked very well. I'm sure many other things were that done. I'm, I'm, I'm dramatizing it for the purpose of this talk. So I have got these eight things. And in each of these six companies we talked to, we populated the boxes. Mindset, behavior, action. 
and all these eight attributes. So you had eight multiplied by 324 boxes. And that's how the book came. And that's how the books were published. I think, uh, of course, we may be forgiven for feeling good and proud about what we have done by way of a research project and the books we have written. Uh, but we hope some of you will at least take the trouble to read them uh, because we think it's a wonderful contribution to the young people's thinking. Uh, Garima ji, I think I'll stop here and uh, I think I've spoken enough and perhaps you should ask me some questions. Thank you. Thank you, sir. I don't think so. This is enough for our students. They've learned every second that you were speaking. And I think that you've given them a vision of thinking long term and continuously learning. This is going to actually help them shape up their future. We have a couple of questions from the students, sir. Shall we start with the question and answer round? Yes. Sure. So the first question is that we request you to talk a bit about your journey with Tata Sons Limited and how Tata became such a big and reputed organization. Well, you know, I should tell you the journey of Tata rather than my journey. Mm -hmm. Tata began about 150 years ago, 1868 to be precise, so 152 years ago. And uh, Jamsheji Tata was the founder of Tata. And... Uh, he died in 1904 uh, at that time. But uh, he thought of business as being part of the community. And while business should make profit, legitimate profit, it should think of the community. And he made his money in a few textile mills. He started as a textile group in those days. But he gradually learned that those who have steel, don't, don't remember that in... Uh, 1870s, uh, steel was considered like artificial intelligence and computers are considered today, you know. It was a cutting edge of technology. And he heard a speech in London by Sir Thomas Carlyle, who said the nation which has steel will have gold. And he said, "By here's a colonial country, the British were ruling it. I don't think anybody had even thought of independence. Gandhiji was not there. Uh, talking of 1875, he said, we must have steel in India. And he thought of three things that India needs. Steel, uh, hydroelectric power. In those days, Bombay City was having kerosene lamps. Okay. We can't imagine it, but I think young people should know that only 100 years ago, 100 and, uh, 120 years ago, Bombay City was running on kerosene lamps. A few hotels like Taj Mahal Hotel and all have generators. So he said, there's lots of water on the Western Ghats where the rainwater is coming and flowing into lakes. Why can't I get power out of it? And even today, that's one of the places where electricity is generated. The third thing he said is, there was no IIM, IIT, Asian Education Group, nothing was there. He said, until Indian people learn to do research, and this is an important message for you, for all of us today, we will never be self-sufficient. Atma Nirbhar was started at that time, not now. And he said, I am prepared to give land and create the Indian Institute of Science. So that's how it started. That was his way of showing that uh, he cares for the community. And then when he died, he had two sons. They took over. Then they died in due course. Unfortunately, that family did not continue in the sense that they had no children. So when the two sons died, they left all their wealth, which is a lot of money in those days, into charitable trusts. They just donated all their money because there was no son or daughter to give it to or son or daughter to fight about it. And therefore, it's a charitable trust that own the Tata companies today. And so in the process, what has happened is, as more and more companies came up, more profits were made, the profits went as dividends to the trust. The trust is doing social work. And now uh, all Tata people are very proud that uh, the Tata trusts are probably one of the uh, most well-endowed uh, charitable organizations in the world, not just in India. Right. So it began with the community for the community and it is still within the community. That's correct. And that's very, very important and precious for all Tata people. My own right. journey is a small part of this wonderful group which I have been privileged to work for. 
Sure. So the second question is, what leadership skills are required to make people in an organization embrace change? You know, I don't know if it's leadership skills, because to embrace change, you must be convinced of two things. First, you have to get used to uncertainty and ambiguity. You must get used to the idea that the world is uncertain and solutions are ambiguous. If you come in with the idea that I can do A, B, C, D and everything will fall into place, then you've got a problem. You're not going to embrace change. You can come with the solution. So, again, I take, I take practical examples because I find that, especially for those who have not been CEOs, uh, it may sound very lofty. But when a young couple gets... When you're a bachelor and the girl is a uh, single, uh, they are leading their own bindas life, you know, whatever it is, studying, getting a job. But once the families or they have decided to get married, uh, they have to learn to embrace change. And uh, after a few years, uh, the family starts to grow. They are forced to embrace change. Why? Because they know it's uncertainty. And no couple discovers new uncertainties. I mean, their mothers have been through it, their grandmothers have been through it, but still for them it is brand new. So this whole point about uh, embracing change is accepting first that the future is uncertain and ambiguous. Don't kid yourself that COVID-19 has never happened before. We weren't alive when COVID-18 happened and when COVID-17 happened, but it did happen. There's enough material and literature on it. So, accept that uncertainty and ambiguity is the nature of the future. And the second is that if you don't change, then change will swallow you. If you've got these two in your head, then you're okay. I hope that answers it, Garima. Definitely. So, very well said. Uh, so, the next question is, how can the vision and mission of, an, uh, of the institution be aligned with the goals of individual stakeholders like employees? You know, it's the other way around. Uh, every institution has a vision and a mission. And only people who can identify with that should join. Otherwise, they won't be happy. So, the people who join Unilever or Tata uh, can expect to work loyally, adapt to change, and retire with a reasonable amount of money. But they will not become the richest man in the world. Right? So, Tata and Unilever will not change that, their approach. If you want to be the richest man in the world, you'll have to do something else. So, it all depends on what your value is. If you are coming from the mindset that the end matters, the means don't matter, then you'll be very unhappy in Tata and Unilever. If you're coming from the mindset that the means do matter and so also the ends, you may be able to fit it to Unilever. So, I think institutions have their own um, uh, values and culture and individuals who are of a similar thinking can be surviving there. Those who are got different programs in their mind have to find other institutions which lie with theirs. Okay. Sure. Thank you, sir. The next question is that, sir, as a fresh graduate, how do I work on developing my leadership skills while studying uh, that would help in the, that would help starting my future and career? You know, you have to keep learning by doing. I'm giving you my experience. There's nothing very smart or clever about the answer. So if you're looking for some uh, uh, something fantastic, you're not going to get it. Right? We are, so we are getting fantastic answers and learning a lot. You know, when I joined, uh, I studied physics honors and I studied electronics. And that's in 1960s, okay? Uh, nobody understood, certainly in my family, what does electronics mean? Because people said electrical engineering, bijli banate, and that they understood. But electronics was something uh, people didn't understand. And I studied computer science. In 1966, India had two computers. And I went and enrolled for computer science. Because when you're young, you think of... And I had dreamt of a career where I would be dealing with computers for the rest of my life. In fact, I joined Hindustan even in the... 
the computer science department. But then uh, after five years, I said, boy, this is going to take a long time to happen. My hair will become gray and we'll still be debating about computers. We had a shortage of foreign exchange. We had unions which would not let computers come in. Uh, it was, uh, so I worked for five years. I learned COBOL programming, Fortran programming, uh, IBM machine, ICL machines. But I said, this is not going to work. And uh, when I started to look out for a change, uh, Hindustan even said, you look like a smart guy. Why don't you come and become marketing and sales? Now, for an, as an engineer, for me, that was, uh, to be honest, <laughs> I said, I was here, how did I get here? How did I marketing and sales? You know? <laughs> they sent me to work as a salesman. Because they said, if you don't do what your subordinates do, you'll never learn to lead them. And so I was sent off to Nasik uh, to work with the salesman and to go shop to shop, to Kirana shops and sell Life Boy and Dalda. And I found it very, uh, at that time, demeaning. But I learned. I learned the ropes of the business that way. So you have to come down from a high horse and make mistakes and learn from people who may be junior to you in hierarchy, but senior to you in experience. And that's how you learn the, the dignity of work and labor. Mm -hmm. And uh, I would say to you, when you leave your MBA college, even if you got the gold medal, I'm not trying to diminish the value of the gold medal or your uh, dean's list or whatever, but please walk into the world thinking, I know nothing. Mm -hmm. And spend each day of your career saying, just because I know one more thing, it doesn't mean I know everything. Even now I'm telling you at my age, I'm 75. <laughs> I think there are so many things I don't know. Uh, but I know that I can't learn everything there is to know. God is not going to give me that much time. But I'm trying. Why, why do I talk to people like you, young people like you? Through your questions, I get a sense of what is going on in your mind. That keeps me young. So whatever you do, you must keep yourself young and learning, then your leadership skills will fall into place, not the other way around. You don't look for leadership skills. You know, if you're standing in the slips, if you're taking a cricket metaphor, uh, if you're standing in the slips, you must alert. The ball may come to you. But if you're trying to see where the ball goes and you should be there, you'll never get a catch. Right. I think that keenness and that attitude is very important. Very well said, sir. So the next question is from Aman Sinha and uh, surely he is somebody who is looking forward to a long-term goal. He's asking that questions that are uh, required or the qualities exactly which are required to take the person at the very top and to be able to sustain himself. He wants to know about those qualities. You know, the qualities are, uh, there are a dime a dozen, lots of books which will tell you what qualities you should have. But I want to answer the second part of your question to sustain yourself. Mm -hmm. uh, because quality, if I tell you, you must have hard work, you must have loyalty, sincerity, innovative thinking, <coughs> good relations with people, uh, you'll be right to say it's because it's a naibad. <coughs> but what I'm about to tell you, you'll say it's a naibad. As you rise in your organization or your career, as you become more successful, you acquire more power. You have chased power and got it. You have chased money and you've got it. The tragedy about power and money is that once you've got it, you don't know what to do with it. Once you've got it, you don't know what to do with it. How many rich people don't know what to do with the money they've got? In the same way, there are powerful people who don't know what to do with their power. But the most damaging thing about power is that it damages your brain. You know, if I play lots of tennis, if I do too much of weightlifting, gymnasium, I may damage my muscles. I may limp or I may have my shoulder in a strap. And then you can see that I'm hurt and, you know, you can be helpful. A powerful manager's, a powerful leader's brain is damaged and you can't see it. Look around you, you'll find people like that. Very powerful people in public life. I don't have to mention their names. You can look around them. They will talk as though they know everything and wag their finger because they are very powerful people. Their brain is damaged. 
I have written a book on this called Crash, which also Rohit Jajarani can uh, offer to you. And what power does to the brain of a leader. I would therefore say and reply to you, all the attributes for success will all come. You will learn it. But remember, when you practice all those attributes and become very powerful, your brain will gradually get damaged. And uh, you have to protect yourself against that. I call it having a Clementine mirror because I've written in the book the story of Winston Churchill, who was so full of power that his brain was actually damaged. He did lots of damaging things. He did a lot of things also. And his wife, Clementine, would periodically tell him, as my wife has told me during my life, <laughs> You know, that's not a nice way to talk to people. That's not the nice, that's not the right way. I don't know the subject of what you're talking about, but uh, you don't deal with you, other people than that. And at that time, of course, you'll be very angry. But later on, you think about it and say, well, only a wife has the courage to tell her husband where he takes off. <laughs> a wife is the most valuable attribute, a valuable uh, management development program a man can have. And conversely also, by the way, for powerful women also, it's exactly the same. They need a man. And those who don't have such a person have a serious lacuna. Mrs. Gandhi, for example. Uh, they don't have somebody to sort of... And I won't talk of current leadership. <laughs> right. Thank you, sir. So, so we have our law students also here and they have a couple of questions. The first one is that, do you think law has burdened the post of director of a company with a plethora of mandatory reports, compliance and regulations to be observed? You know, I don't blame the law for it. Uh, what the, the person who writes laws and the person who maintains the legal system and the person who delivers justice are three different people. Three different institutions. Uh, bureaucrats writes the law. Parliament enacts it. Bureaucrats write it. Uh, then there is a regulator who implements it. And the uh, laws, court, uh, justice system, courts, which uh, uh, give judicial judgments. These are all hopelessly uncoordinated. So a person like me feels the legal system is useless. Now, that's probably uh, not the right judgment to make. We must have only that many laws that we can implement. Why should a murder case, what's that girl's name who died in Delhi? Jessica Lal, right? It took 20 years or something to convict that fellow. There are any number of cases you'll find where FIR has not been filed, people are languishing in jail. India has 700,000 people in jail for whom there's no FIR law. It is those aspects of the law. So unless you can have an implementable law, citizens won't feel that they have a system of justice. And it is that aspect. And only the judiciary and people who studied law can solve it. This is what I mean by long term. Some of you may become uh, people who can champion this cause. But if we just keep on adding laws, it's like putting on weight, you know, when you cross 30, 35, 40. Very soon you're 60 and you're sort of heavy. Uh, the laws like that. It's an over, it's an obese, unfit human being. And many people have contributed it. The Bhavarchi has contributed, the supplier of meat has contributed, the person himself has contributed to it. So that's surely a vision, sir. Uh, so the next question is uh, that generally we say a managerial person will have a clear and sound understanding of law will be an added advantage to the organization. What is your opinion on this? Uh, I don't know if the word is sound understanding or a sound uh, appreciation. I think there's a difference between appreciation and understanding. I don't think I have a good understanding of the law. In fact, I think the law is stupid in many ways. Uh, that doesn't mean I'm right. I'm just giving you... Because I don't understand all the laws. Some of the laws are written in such a way that you can't even understand. Even lawyers don't understand. But a person must be sensitive and appreciative of the law. The law has a certain purpose. But the law will make mistakes. I'll give you an example. Uh, two years ago, I got a criminal notice. A criminal notice to arrest me without a bail. You know, non-bailable warrant. On the grounds that According to them, I had served as a director in more than 10 companies. 
It took me seven months and a jurmana of 15,000 rupees which I still not got back to close the matter. Not by bribing anybody. I tell them, go to hell. I have not been a director of more than 10 companies. It went all the way to the minister and then it came back and they have given me a 15-page judgment which basically says, I'm sorry, we made a mistake. <laughs> it doesn't say anything. It just says our case was not there. But this is the kind of stupidity uh, that happens. But then, you know, there will always be aberration in a system. I can't blame the law for it. There will be some characters down the line who are implementing it badly. Right. Uh, so the next question is uh, a very interesting one, Radho, that you are a role model to many corporate professionals, both in India and globally. What has been uh, your inspiration? Who is your role model? And what has been your philosophy for a successful personal and professional life? <laughs> you know, um, if when I think back, uh, some people have inspired me, some people have instructed me. Mm -hmm. There's a big difference between the two. A person who inspires you is far away. Gandhiji, Martin Luther King, Nelson Mandela, people who have never met. But I read what they said, I see a video clip of their speech, uh, I thought, think of their thoughts and Josh Adhan. Right. But they cannot instruct me. They cannot teach me. The people who teach me are unknown to anybody else. My father, my professor, my early bosses. If I tell you their names, it will make no difference to you. You'll say I never heard of the guy. So, I think instruction is more important than inspiration. You must get inspiration. Of course, young people must get inspiration. But value the instructor. He may be a simple person who taught you, but gave you values with that. And I cherish them a lot. And if I said, Professor Gitendra Saran Sanyal, people would say, who is he? But for me, he was my inspiration. He was my leader who taught me, or my father. I think, sir, students are actually getting very inspired. And they have a few philosophical questions for you as well. There's one which has come just now. Ends rather than the means is a philosophy which involves you to have less of a conscience. Have you ever had that situation ever and how did you deal with it? Oh, definitely I've had that situation. And I still don't know whether I dealt with them uh, rightly or wrongly. I'll give you an example. Uh, many years ago, I was... I was given my first job as a head of a business, you know, what is called a strategic business unit. And they, although I'm a vegetarian, I was always given non-vegetarian jobs. It was the head of a uh, poultry feed business, you know. So we used to make poultry feed with proteins and nourishment and sell it to chicken farmers mm. who would then rear chicken or eggs and sell them. And uh, on one occasion, uh, a particular farmer uh, took great umbrage that his uh, chickens had died because then he felt it was food poisoning from our feed. Now, one of our managers, who was twice my age at that time, or one and a half times my age, uh, went and he's a good bola bola guy, but he went and gave a statement in the uh, uh, regulatory authority where he speculated that maybe my mixer wasn't working properly. <laughs> and uh, that, of course, created a huge problem for the company. Because they said, you yourself have admitted it. But actually, he hasn't admitted it. He was merely speculating. Right. And I had the dilemma that uh, having got the company into a major soup, should he be sacked or not? Because he's a responsible manager. He's not some... Uh, some and uh, I eased him out of the company. And I felt that the uh, means by which a manager manages are important at the end. He doesn't have to speak an untruth. But neither does he have to give a legal depo deposition of speculation. You know, that's not a, a job a manager can do. So uh, I have had such occasions. So, 
So one question is from our student named Sakshi Chaudhary. She says our lives are totally changed by this COVID and how our nation and us, all of us are taking the advantage of this COVID period is still something that we don't know. How do we do that? Mostly people are taking it as a bad phase of life, but how can we use it for our benefit? Well, what I'm doing to you is exactly that. I've spent the last four months uh, reflecting on my career and what are the ways in which I can renew myself and share the renewal with other people. Mm -hmm. So please uh, think of your goals in life, think of your hobbies, think of the relationships that you have not had the time to do. Put away your mobile phone and your WhatsApps <laughs> and uh, realize uh, and enjoy being an insan, an insaniyat. Uh, right. This is a very good time to do that. Instead of spending all your time, spend some of your time watching Netflix shows and talking to your friends. But think of the grandmother you failed to write a letter to or did not speak to. Sure. That will be helpful. Give me one second. Huh? Sure, sir. I'll call you later. I'm on a call. Hello? Yeah, Polo. Yes. Uh, so those students are very inquisitive, but we'll restrict ourselves with one last question because of the positive of time. The last question is, so what career advice would you like to offer to AEG students? What career advice would I offer them? Lage raho munna vai. Right. There is no shortcut. And if somebody shows you a shortcut, don't take it. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Thank you so much, sir, for gracing us with your esteemed presence today and spending your evening with us. This experience will surely be a rememberable one and it seems to be an honor on uh, to propose a vote of thanks to you on behalf of the directors, faculty members, students and the entire AG fraternity. I thank you for your valuable knowledge that you've shared with us today and I'm sure that it is going to take our students a very, very long way. Thank you so much, sir. For being Thank with you us. for having me and God bless you all the best to AEG.